Good morning and welcome to Matins on this Friday of the third week of Pentecost. Thank you for being with me this morning. Our scriptures for today, we're going to be using Psalm 84. And we're going to jump a good bit in Deuteronomy. So we'll start Deuteronomy chapter 26. Um, but we'll stay in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and uh, finish that chapter today. So before we get into the word, let's pray that God would help us maintain our focus. Would you please pray with me? Bless us, O God, with a reverent sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and may worship you with all our mind and spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O come, let us worship him. Our psalm today is number 84. <clears throat> How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a, has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has found her a house, and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young. By the side of your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, happy are they who dwell in your house. They will always be praising you. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on the pilgrim's way. Those who go through the desolate valley will find it a place of springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. They will climb from height to height, and the God of gods will reveal himself in Zion. Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Hearken, O God of Jacob. Behold our defender, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For one day in your courts is better than a thousand in my own room. And to stand at the threshold of the house of my God and to dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is both sun and shield. He will give grace and glory. No good thing will the Lord withhold from those who walk with integrity. O Lord of hosts, happy are they who put their trust in you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you heard the prayer of Christ, your chosen one, and raised him to the lasting joy of your presence. Help us in our pilgrimage toward you to love your church and to offer the sacrifice of praise at your altar, that we may hasten to your home and joyfully look upon your glorious splendor, which we have seen in your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right. Our Old Testament lesson today is from Deuteronomy chapter 26. We begin at verse 1. This chapter is titled, Offerings of First Fruits and Tithes. Moses is still giving instructions to the people on God's behalf. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an, for an inheritance, and have taken possession of it and live in it, 
You shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to, into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And you shall make response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. And there he became a, a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God, and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you, and to your house, you, and the Levite, and the sojourner who is among you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second lesson picks up where we left off yesterday. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 8, and we begin at verse 16. This section is entitled, Commendation of Titus. But thanks be to God, who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal... But being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our good will. We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us, for we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. And with them we are sending our brother, whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets, but now in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death 
and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. What we ask of thee wisely, O God, do thou of thy great bounty bestow. With all that we so deeply need and know not how to ask, that in the knowledge of thy love we may have the peace that comes not of our striving, but of thy gift. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning my prayer comes before you. Give me the joy of your saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let my mouth be full of your praise and your glory all the day long. Every day will I praise you, and praise your name forever and ever. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. He redeems my life from the grave and crowns me with mercy and loving kindness. Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come before you. Let us pray. O Lord Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. <clears throat> so, we're continuing in the law. And this is why I hope you're seeing that there are some 613 laws here. Um, we skipped about nine chapters. We left off at the beginning of verse seven, chapter 17 yesterday, um, talking about the feast, or talked about justice and appointing judges. Um, and it kept going. We, we got a little bit into... Um, Laws about the kings, you know, how um, how they would appoint a king that God would choose. Then there was, uh, we skipped a bunch about laws regarding the priests and the Levites. There were some laws forbidding certain practices. Um, <laughs> there's one that strictly prohibits human sacrifice. Um, there's a bunch about magic and fortune-telling and sorcery and that kind of stuff. 
God has forbidden us to participate in that. Um, hmm. And then there's mention of a new prophet like Moses. Now we get into chapter 19, laws concerning cities of refuge, property boundaries, uh, laws about witnesses. So we're still talking justice in certain places. Laws about warfare. Uh, atonement for unsolved murders. Marrying female captives. Inheritance rights of firstborn. Um, what to do if you have a rebellious son and you don't want to give him an inheritance. Um, someone who's hanged on a tree. And then there's a variety of... Well, this one, this section in chapter 22 is just called Various Laws. A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, so 22, then chapter 22 then gets into Laws Concerning Sexual Immorality. It's pretty clear. Um, adultery. Uh, let's see. There's something about dishonesty and giving it, giving your daughter away if you're a father. Uh, premarital sex. Um, um, Let's see. Wow. Stuff about eunuchs and men who are disfigured. Uncleanness. Laws about slavery. Laws about divorce. More laws about marriage and slavery. Treating your slaves correctly. Treating sojourners appropriately. Um, some of that about farming and leaving the excess for people to glean. Um, more marriage laws, more miscellaneous. Then we get into chapter 26, finally. So it covers a whole range of things, okay? There's a lot. So this one is about first fruits. So when you finally come into, and, and all this is, bef he's preparing them before they go into the promised land, right? He's getting them ready. And <coughs> I like how it says, pardon me. Um, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it. These words recur repeatedly, right? When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you. It's a reminder. The, this, this one here is about first fruits. You shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall put it in a basket. You shall go to the place the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who's in office at that time and say to him, and you say this, and then the priest will take the basket from your hand and set it on the altar before the Lord your God. Okay. So what's going on here? The ritual offering of first fruits reminded the individual worshiper that the promised land is God's gracious gift and is to be received with joyful thanksgiving. So before you take any of the harvest for yourself, the first portion you give to God. And part of that is to acknowledge that you grew this crop on land that was given to you by God. So you're giving back to him. One of the things that, that we teach in stewardship, um, and when, when we talk about the proper way to give an offering to God, is you take it off the top. You start with, you know, if you make... Whatever. It's, if you make $1,000, whatever, and you you know you want to tithe from that, or you want to give an offering from that, you decide what that is before you pay any bills, before you buy anything you want. You decide, you know, I'm going to give 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 1%. 
Okay, so you're going to give what's one percent of a thousand? Ten dollars. So you take ten dollars out of that thousand and you set it aside for God. Then you do the rest. Okay. Now you all know I think that the word tithe comes from the word for one tenth. So one tenth of a thousand would be a hundred dollars. So you take a hundred out of that thousand and you set it aside for God. And that would be your tithe. It goes to God first before you pay any bills, before you do anything else. Right? That's God is saying, out of thanksgiving for everything God has done for us, we should give to him first before we do anything else with our with our goods, with our harvest. All right, now, <clears throat> and make to make his name to dwell there. Go to the place the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. Okay, it's taken us to 1 Kings. So I want to check that out. Let's go to 1 Kings. This is 1 Kings 8, verse 18. But the Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Okay, so he's talking about a temple here in 1 Kings. But, um, so in the temple, the Lord who dwells in darkness chose to reveal, to reveal himself in accord with the covenant made when he brought the fathers out of the land of Egypt. And it gives us another reference here. I think you're getting the point, right? This is where God is going to reveal himself. This is where, yeah. Yahweh's name bears his being and power to save. That's where he makes his name to dwell. Okay, his, his very being. All right. I don't know what happened there, but I think we're still going. So I apologize for the interruption. Um, so what, what this is saying is at that point, when they get to the promised land, God will give them a place and tell them where to set up and worship him. And that's where the offerings are to be taken. And you go to that priest, and here's what you'll say. I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. So right away, as you give the offering, you're acknowledging, um, you're acknowledging what God has done for you. Is what He's saying. I am in the I'm in the land that was promised to our fathers. I am in the promised land. I am able to give because God has given to me. <clears throat> Then the priest takes your basket, and you shall make response. So the priest takes the basket, and you're still going as the giver, as the individual worshiper. A wandering Aramean was my father. Hmm. And he went down in Egypt and sojourned there. So he's going all the way back to Abraham, right? He went down into Egypt, sojourned there, few in number, and there became a great nation. Well, that's Jacob and Joseph. When Joseph brought his brothers and his father to Egypt, and they brought all of their families and their servants with them, and we became, there he became a, a nation, great and mighty and populous. So, from Joseph to Moses was over four hundred years. That's a lot of generations, and there was a lot of brothers and their wives and a lot of people to uh, have have big families. The Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. We cried to the Lord. The Lord heard our voice and brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the Exodus story. They're supposed to remember. And I skipped over a bunch. I hope you picked up on that. But it's, it's about remembering what God has done for us. And then you say what? And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. So you've taken the land that God gave you. You have 
planted and nurtured, and now your your um, your crops have borne fruit, and you've plucked the fruit or the or harvested the the grain or whatever it was, and the first bunch of it you're given back to God because you're saying, which you O Lord have given me. I bring the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given me. Even the fruit comes from God. That's an acknowledgement. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. And you shall rejoice in all the good that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house, you and the Levite and the sojourner who is among you. So, you and your family. And who else is in your household? Well, your servants, right? So... The adults, the children, you know, um, the servants, even the guests of your house, the sojourner, right? If anybody's wandering through and you're just giving them a place to stay for the night, those two will worship with you. And the Levite, the priestly class, if they're in your house, if you are providing them shelter, they come with you too. Everyone is to worship in this way. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay. Quick summary here. This brief recital of Israelite history is similar to a creed or even a liturgy. As the Israelites offer the first fruits of the land, they remember their ancestors who had been landless and suffered countless hardships in Egypt before the Lord finally delivered them. The worshippers' concluding words addressed directly to the Lord confess that this first fruit offering is a gift from Him. Oh, and the wandering Aramean is a reference actually to Jacob, who spent 20 years in Aram working for his uncle Laban. I went, I went back a little bit far, sorry. In Egypt, the Israelites worked as slaves, had no land of their own. Um, so, all right, so that's Deuteronomy. Let's, let's go back and hit, hit Paul's lesson again here just for a moment. All right, so <clears throat> Paul's talking about Titus. That's how we finished yesterday. By going to complete the Corinthian collection, Titus gladly shared in Paul's own pastoral love for this flock. Titus's main concern is for them as sheep, not for the contributions he might fleece from them. Okay, so Titus had been sent to them worked with them, helped them get through the things that, that Paul had written them about to say, you know, this is not how Christians behave, particularly the infighting among them. And Titus worked through them. And you almost get the impression that Titus left before his work was complete because he wanted to go and tell Paul the good things that happened, that they did work through their problems. Um <sighs> So and then he says, and he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he's going to you of his own accord. Sounds like he's going back and wants to. And that's good. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. Interesting that he's not named, right? But Paul's travel companion here is usually identified as Luke usually. However, Acts contains only two passing references to the Judean Relief Fund, which is what they're talking about here, whereas we would expect more detail if Luke himself had been closely involved because Luke wrote Acts. So, not really sure. Um, taken as the third gospel by some commentators, where he says, who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel, but the expression here does not hint at a written document. Um, yeah, so not sure if it's Luke that he's talking about or not. Could be. A lot of scholars think it is, but anyway. And not only that, but he's been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us. That's that. Remember Jerusalem and, and the Judean area is having a famine, so they're going to the churches that are far away from there and other parts of the that area of the world to collect, right? That's that act of grace we talked about yesterday. <coughs> Certain churches 
formally commissioned the brother from verse 18, that unknown famous preacher, to accompany Paul as he raised those relief funds. And this relief fund was conceived as a thank offering, right? What do we talk about in Deuteronomy? Take your first fruits and you give them back to God as thanks for everything he's done for you. Even those who were poor could give something. Um, we take this course so that no one should blame us about this gener generous gift that is being administered by us. Paul's overall responsibility for organizing the relief fund forms part of the discharge of his apostleship, a task delegated in Corinth to Titus. So it sounds like Paul is just trying to say, look, we're not just, we're not just um, coercing you to give us money. This is, this is needed, and all the churches are participating in it, right? For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. Yeah, see, we don't want you. To, we know that God knows that this is an honorable endeavor, an honorable ministry, and we want you to know it's honorable too. With them, we are sending our brother, whom we've often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. So, this is another unknown, unnamed member of Paul's inner circle. But when Titus would read this letter aloud, to the assembled church, he would have identified both this brother and the other brother who may or may not have been Luke. So Titus could have pointed to them and they would have all known who it was. Um, Paul has repeatedly delegated responsibilities and even sensitive tasks to this particular co-worker, right? He said um, he's been often tested, right? And then Titus, who is a member of Paul's pastoral staff, as we know, shares his ministry and will appear again in Corinth as Paul's authorized representative. So he's coming back. Titus's ministry has a wider scope than that of a presbyter in a local church, which is, um, that's the word they use here in the Greek. It just means pastor. Um, and as for our brothers, these other two nameless men, they are messengers of the church's the glory of Christ. Um, literally the word there is apostles in a broad sense which meant emissaries the first brother will represent the churches that send them while Titus will represent the apostle Paul as officers bearing as officers responsible for stewarding the church's earthly goods the two brothers appear in the role of New Testament deacons but with responsibility going beyond the local congregation okay so Basically, what I'm telling you here is there is a structure to the very early church. There are bishops. There are um, actually senior bishops and junior and local bishops. There are pastors. And there are deacons or priests and deacons. Um, <clears throat> the glory of Christ. How does he say it? They are messengers of churches, the glory of Christ. As Christ himself is really present in all Christians, so he is really present in these two brothers and in Titus. This truth motivates hospitality and all forms of mutual love among Christians. So knowing that Paul is sending his... Paul's in jail writing this. So he can't be there. So he's sending his best and most trusted co-workers. Students, maybe, but co-workers. And that inspires these folks. Because living Christianity involves not just a vertical relationship between uh, the Lord and the individual, but also the horizontal dimension, right, of relationships between Christians and among Christians. Paul encourages the Corinthians to show the other apostolic churches how their faith is flowering in attitudes and deeds of love. All right, let me read a summary here, and then we'll wrap it up. As Paul leads a great money-gathering effort, capital campaign, he takes care that the clergy and laity work together to ensure that the church's financial dealings are untainted by scandal. In our churches, we should honor those who undertake such tasks 
<laughs> Thanks be to God for his gift of willing servants who distribute the life-giving gospel in all their service in Christ. Okay, so he's trying to make sure, like it, like it said there, it's untainted by scandal, that everything is on the up and up, it's above board, and that he doesn't lose anyone's trust as they, um, as they request their money. And that is a huge responsibility on the part of church leadership, as, as we all know. Okay, that's a good place to stop. Would you please pray with me? Almighty God, grant to your church your Holy Spirit and the wisdom which comes down from heaven, that your word may not be bound, but have free course, and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve you, and in the confession of your name may abide to the end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the Almighty and Merciful Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. All right, that concludes our matins for this Friday. Thank you for spending this time with me. Thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day he's given to you. Uh, we will do matins again tomorrow. So until we can be together again, may God bless and keep you. <laughs>